Now, agriculture has been in the spotlight, of course, under the net zero carbon debate, contributing 48% of New Zealand's greenhouse gases. The energy sector sits a close second, though, at 41% of total emissions, but has yet to receive the same pressure to mitigate its emissions. Of course, we have certainly seen a, a bit of a change of understanding there under the lockdown. Canterbury farmer and Nuffield scholar Cam Henderson believes the two sectors should work together more closely uh, to collectively lower emissions. So Cam spoke uh, this week in an uh, up-and-coming story with Richard Rennie for Farmers Weekly and joins us now. Evening, Cam. Good evening, Sarah. Firstly, can you give us a little bit of a background on your farming career where you are in mid-Canterbury and what led you to this passion around this particular topic uh, to travel, of course, the world with your Nuffield scholarship? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been in Canterbury, in North Canterbury, based just outside of Oxford, about uh, about 40 minutes inland from Christchurch. Been here for about 10 years. Um, we converted the dairy farm uh, from an old sheep station, and um, and prior to that, uh, I was born and bred in the Waikato um, dairy import from the North Island, so uh, like many of us down here. Um, so I guess I've, uh, Canterbury's been a bit of a hotbed for environmental impacts for a while, mostly the nutrients, but um, I guess there's been a drift, gradual drift into the greenhouse gas issue as well, which has um, seen a lot more attention over the last few years. And uh, I guess uh, I saw a farmer's focus had been firmly fixed on the nutrient side of things and thought, well, actually, this greenhouse gas issue could be something that sneaks up on us and really wasn't getting uh, enough attention. So I wanted to look at um, what options uh, were available overseas for mitigation and, um, and actually took it a lot further than what I first expected. And, and instead of just mitigating uh, options on farm to actually helping other sectors mitigate their options as well. So whether there can be a win-win situation out of this. So that's uh, really where the topic came from. Interesting. So I'm just going to try anaerobic digesters capable of turning effluent into biogas is what you've been looking into. And of course, electricity generating solar arrays, uh, some of the options you've visited during your study. Can you explain how in depth the technology is around the world and where New Zealand can catch up on? Or is this a new space? Um, the technology, the basis of the technology has been around for a while and, and has actually got a strong history of being tested in New Zealand. Um, but like a lot of climate technology, it's developing pretty quickly. And uh, New Zealand's technology is, is fallen behind what's going on overseas. So it's not only anaerobic digesters, which take bio, any sort of biomass that can be manure, it can be um, stubble from crops, it can be any, any sort of waste biological product and turn it into a, a gas that can either be burnt or, or used like a natural gas um, in any, any other natural gas type system. Um, there's, there's solar power, wind power, um, on-farm hydro, um, a lot of these options are being used on small scale around the world. So the technology all exists. There's not, not really any need for any new innovation in this space. Um, what, what the key factor is internationally that we don't have here in New Zealand is the policy and incentive to really encourage farmers to take up some of these activities. Yeah, and you say here um, that uh, it's around the carbon prices and carbon storage schemes where we've got the things out of whack to give that incentive. Have you got any sort of comparisons around the incentive to plant out that valuable farmland and forestry versus how this can be an incentive? Um, yeah, sure. I guess probably the, the one big example wasn't so much in forestry, it was in, in solar panels. Um, over in California, farmers there can install solar panels and generate electricity throughout the year, and then they get the full retail price of that solar power for the entire year, so long as their demand and their supply match from an annual basis. So in New Zealand, when we have a solar panel on the house, we, we really only get the economic incentive to use that power as it's being generated, whereas uh, internationally, yeah, there are policies that just encourage farmers or any, any, any users of solar panels um, to generate power year round. It's, it, it, it adds quite a lot to the economics of some of these um, scenarios um, 
when, when you can generate you know, power at 24 cents a kilowatt hour versus what we can get here in New Zealand at 7 cents a kilowatt hour. So, Kim, I understand that you have been harvesting solar to power your family uh, farming dairy shed. Of course, you've got those massive wintering barns, which would be fantastic for solar and putting it into the grid. My concern, though, where a lot of this has fallen down is the calculations and the accounting systems around this are just too complicated. To It's just easier to tax on stock units. It is. I think for most farmers, there is a lot of technology in the background there that uh, most of us just don't understand. I had no idea about it when the solar panels were first installed. I needed a lot of support to do it. Um, but there aren't really many vendors in, in New Zealand um, that are specialising in this type of technology. And there again, they don't really have the policy to back them up to warrant putting together some of these really, uh, really neat programs and installation packages for farmers. So. Um, I think it's there again, it, it came out of one of the recommendations was to develop better better systems for farmers to be able to install rather than just throw the technology at them and say, here, make what you can of it, to actually design some systems that work well for farms in different parts of the country. It is a real shame that, of course, we don't have the physical field days where we can see these things in action. Um, now, this anaerobic digester, Lorna Hum has said that she saw a really good one in action in Scotland and that it's very much a part of our future. What are some of the barriers and uh, and who do we need to lobby to be able to encourage the incentives around this type of uh, energy, circular energy, basically? Um, it does come down to price. The anaerobic digesters are quite expensive to install and to run. And internationally, particularly for dairy systems, uh, they generate a lot more manure because they house their animals year-round, uh, can capture all that manure and feed it directly into the digesters. So we simply just don't generate on a per farm basis enough effluent for a lot of these systems to work. But there's quite a few being built in, uh, in the likes of California and Ireland that are using other feedstocks as well. So I mentioned earlier, um, crop stubble, you can throw in old silage, um, straw, even uh, some being developed to throw um, old willows and trees into as well. So really anything biological you could throw in. And uh, there's, there's a biodigester in Germany on a farm where they're generating enough gas that they've converted uh, a tractor to run on the biomethane generated by the anaerobic digester. So the farm is becoming more circular in terms of its energy use. So the technology there again all exists. Um, we just haven't developed the systems that work well here in New Zealand yet. Mm, imagine that when we have that ma major marketing incentive to be not only um, carbon neutral but circular in our waste systems as well. Uh, there's just so many layers to that. So Cam, thank you so much for taking a year out of your life uh, to be able to bring this insight through your Nuffield Scholarship. And of course we need to give a, th a shout out. Uh, you will have some webinars coming up shortly that people can get on and watch and learn more about your report. Yep, that's correct. Yes, it's a little bit more detail and I can talk through some more of the scenarios and what I saw while I was travelling for the year. So go to ruralleaders.co.nz to subscribe to those webinars that were announced out actually today in terms of date. Cam, before I let you go, <laughs> a number of uh, parents saying they're really looking forward to their kids going back to school. That's mm -hmm. their level two thing. What is yours? Uh, well, actually, my first child was born on the first day of lockdown. So she wow. has yet to meet a large chunk of the family. So the first thing we did once uh, we heard Level 2 was coming up was book some flights home to my family in the Waikato. So little Annie uh, gets to meet her grandparents and all the family on my side of the family. So that's um, something really special that we can look forward to. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much and congratulations on everybody listening and watching uh, that uh, to be able to bring a beautiful girl under lockdown. I've also got some friends I can't wait to give a wee cuddle to the little one as well. That's Cam Henderson, a Nuffield Scholar there on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country.